So um, in 2007, Audible moved to Newark from uh, suburban Wayne, the Willowbrook Mall. Um, I consider this one of the better decisions that we've made as a company, I've made as a leader in 20 years. We were a NASDAQ company at the time, and uh, many thought it was just plain crazy to move to Newark. Newark was home to poverty, unemployment, crime, political dysfunction. Um, I was told we'd lose up to 25% of our people by, by consultants. We got no government subsidies. It seemed relatively illogical. Now I'm happy to say people actually like the idea of working at Audible because we're in Newark and how we roll in Newark. Um, we don't talk about it that much. We're more of a show-don't-tell gang, but um, the effort has helped refine us as a company. Um, I also think that the, uh, our embrace of the urban core may be a guide to how entrepreneurs from companies can actually address inequality and urban transformation. So I want to talk about that today, but first a bit about me, uh, a little bit about Audible, and first uh, how I learned to turn uh, first ideas into reality. So my first experience of a startup was in Rolling Stone in the early days, and I know I have not changed a bit, I have to say it, as I get it. Uh, we practiced a, a particularly new kind of literary long-form truth-telling at Rolling Stone. And I, I will never forget, it really was an, an amazing experience to be part of an institution that um, was imprinting the culture with something new. The sense of spirit, the elan of being part of that was something that I always will remember, and I'd like to think it, it represents some of the best of the audible spirits, too. But at the process, I, I learned to synthesize information over 20 years as a writer. I learned how to persuade, I learned how to articulate, I learned how to make ideas real, albeit as uh, long-form articles and, and books. I also had the great gift of having uh, one of the great American novelists, Ralph Ellison, as my uh, teacher and my mentor. Um, Ralph taught me many, many things, and I learned among many things was that uh, American literature is a function of how we talked in the old days, how we bragged and sold and told stories around campfires. He taught me that to love the, the sound of well-composed words. And I had a really great career as a writer, but I always knew I couldn't give my readers one thing, which was time to read my often quite long books. So eventually, Ralph's teachings about the power of the sound of literature, uh, my own focus on the value of time, and a whole lot of invented technology, including Audible inventing the first digital audio player, commercializing it in 1997, it's in the Smithsonian now, um, begat audible.com. We launched the business uh, at least five years before anything like a market was ready, so many near-death experiences ensued. But um, onward from there, we fast forward, and now many, many millions of people either drive to work in the morning or get up on an exercise bike listening to Colin Firth or Anne Hathaway or Nicole Kidman or Dustin Hoffman reading them a story for Audible. Our customers actually give us almost two hours per day on average on a global basis because we imbue this time you can't look at a screen and you can't read with value. Uh, our listeners actually bought 1.2 billion hours of programming from us in 2014. And to do this, you become a big company. We have people in 13 global centers. We're growing very fast, even at scale. Uh, my focus as founder now is the entrepreneurialism of scale. By traditional measures, our heavy growth has benefited Newark. We came with 120 US employees. Uh, we now have, uh, we've added 600 jobs. Our payroll tax has tripled, uh, around $15 million in CapEx and, uh, and enhanced rent. We try to source all the food for the cafeteria from Newark. We buy tickets, the Devils and, and JPEC. We're very, very active in investing in the city that way. Yet a third of the people in Newark still dwell in poverty. And other companies in Newark have had trouble growing jobs at all or increasing the taxable wealth to make life better. Um, our first focus when we came was actually on education. I'd been on the board of something called Uncommon Schools, which I encourage you to check out. It runs 42 of the most amazing urban turnaround schools really teaching kids out of poverty. And their flagship, uh, when I was there when it started, it was called North Star Academy. We began having the kids from uh, the high school come in and become our paid interns. Uh, they, were, they became an, an incredibly powerful part of a culture that includes actors and rocket scientists and English majors. Um, and when they started graduating, they became audible scholars. So they, began, uh, they got mentors and uh, financial support 
and guaranteed jobs, most of them being the highest earners in their family on our, on our part-time wages. Uh, all the uh, employees know they can grab a Kindle, load it up with our immersion reading technology that synchronizes text and audio, and go in and help 10-year-olds in Newark in the fourth and fifth grade uh, deal with the fact that a poor kid tends to have four million fewer, fewer English words at their disposal than a rich kid, and this technology tends to address it. We changed our mission as a company to include socioeconomic diversity, not just diversity of preference and origins. Uh, we, we added urban renaissance to our mission. Um, I joined the Economic Development Corporation board, fascinated by, by economic development. I rose to the chairman of that. I began to give speeches. I wrote op-ed page pieces. And I was um, noting things such as the fact that residing next to a political patronage system that everyone knows about, born of 70 years of a deprivation in a place like Newark, there's actually a shadow nonprofit uh, set of patronage employments. It's massive, and it's called the nonprofit sector. 55% of the entities in Newark don't pay taxes. The business of the city really became the amelioration of poverty, but the investment's all at the outcome of poverty. I also pointed out that 75,000 jobs have been created in New York since Audible moved in 2007, simply from A round financing on, on early stage tax. This doesn't include the seedlings that are still at, uh, at angel stage. Um, I uh, also talked about the ironies of Connecticut and New Jersey. Um, what do they have in common? Well, they are the two richest states in the country in terms of per capita income and number of millionaires. But they also share the fact that their cities are deeply challenged. Look at West Hartford, look at Bridgeport, look at New Haven, look at Trenton, look at Newark. And how about Camden, top of the crime, crime statistics, only 25 kids in Camden took the SATs this year, and only three were made it to college proficiency. There's a macroeconomic sucking of wealth out of Connecticut and New Jersey, at least its inner cities, back into New York City in the same way it flew out for almost 20 years after 1965. The good news is that um, there are avenues of hope and redress, although somewhat non-obvious. Um, I hope you know about the concept of the creative economy. This is where engineers and artists come together, and because of their combination of their work, neighborhoods bloom with incredibly low capital intensity. This is the story in Brooklyn, and now companies are starting and actually going 55 minutes out from Manhattan into the wilds of Brooklyn, paying triple the rent as you'd pay in Newark, and, uh, and have terrible bandwidth and other, other facilities. But it doesn't really matter, because that's what the, the trend's doing. Um, we have about 80 people in, in Berlin. Berlin was a, one of the poorest cities in Europe until literally seven or eight years ago, when the combination of an art scene and an early stage tech scene, almost all of it uh, financed by American capital, came together to create an incredibly thriving city, where one neighborhood after another is turned into something that employs poorer kids from Southern Europe and where rich kids from Northern Europe come and buy condos and open galleries. Um, it, it's really clear that the only way to create jobs and taxable revenue and the only way to connect the darkened urban core to the growth economy is by connecting it to technology. That's where the growth is. We need to invest to make this happen. Uh, to invest in the head end of economic dysfunction versus only the charitable investment in, in the outcome. There really is a way to have capital become missionary rather than mercenary, which frankly, usually that's what it is. Uh, we, we have to see private sector principles do this because that's how you get a lot of success in the world, but we can connect that with social and economic outcomes that actually can be measured. Foot traffic, uh, company creation, taxable revenue, jobs. Uh, and, and it, it's, it's, you'll hear more about this, but the concept of social impact investing is now moving into the world of double line, bottom line investing, meaning the outcomes are financial upside. If you want to be a charity and invest in it, that's great. Just have more money to invest in the next thing. Um, but, but it's also measurable social outcomes, too, making the double bottom line. And meanwhile, great things have been happening in Newark in terms of infrastructure and readiness for, uh, for a turnaround. Um, it's a better seedbed for Renaissance than at any time since it was literally one of the richest cities in the world. 40% uh, of the construction in New Jersey is happening there, almost $2 billion worth. Fantastic old building, the uh, old Haynes building on Broad Street, 1911 department store, 
um, half a million square feet is being completely rehabbed with a Whole Foods committed to the ground floor. It's only a few blocks from our headquarters and 20 hopefully hip amenities there. About 3,000 lofts and apartments are coming up in the next two years. Newark already has 40,000 college students there. Um, I, was, I gave the, the commencement address at Rutgers Newark last year and the, uh, that's technically the most diverse school in the country. It's just amazing. You look at the stats, it's 15% Hindu, 15% Muslim, 15% Jewish. It's fa fantastic to look at it if diversity could have turned you on, which it does me. And um, looking at the entire Prudential Center, which was a little terrifying, was filled um, as, and I sat down next to the chancellor, amazing, amazing missionary person named Nancy Cantor. And I looked at the, the burkas and the yarmulkes and the dreadlocks and the, and the turbans, and I said, this aspirational class of, of all, almost always first-time degree getters will go out and create hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of wealth, but they're not going to think to do it in Newark because Newark hasn't put a flag down to be the place that that should happen, and I think we can change that. Now, is it going to change the uh, political got ahead of itself? Maybe. Is Newark the next Brooklyn? That was only from last week. I mean, I'd like to, uh, to think it's coming, but it, it is at a tipping point. One of the things we're going to do is launch uh, a venture fund and an accelerator. We've been working for about two years with a bunch of political people you all would recognize, uh, uh, technology leaders, investment leaders, um, for, for almost two years on this. Um, I've been a very active angel. It's incredibly it's a lot of fun when you've seen a business come from an idea to becoming a big business, over 20 seedlings, including high flyers like, like Kyle's. I, I do love it. But there's a particular knack to discerning the, the winners early on. Um, plus, the fun plus accelerator model has been mentioned here has really come of age as a very, very, very um, powerful de-risking and acceleration methodology. Uh, the whole thing's a little bit under wraps for various reasons. But actually, if you're interested in this from, from a point of view of of helping the cause. Uh, I'm Don Katz at audible.com. Just let me know if you're interested in getting involved, if uh, uh, we can tell you more about it. You know, I've always thought that companies, even as a writer when I wrote about companies, can have hearts and souls. They can, they can produce meaningful work for the people who work there and even meaningful legacies. Uh, traditional companies kind of skate by. Uh, they, they have it their own way to some extent. They, they create, if they're successful, they do create economic outcomes. They do provide jobs. But um, they also start foundations and give money away to charities. But they actually are, uh, are, are affecting only the functional parts of the economy, partly because of the ineffectiveness of so many, so many charities. But I do believe companies can seek positive disruption and could lift all votes. I, but I, I think that we can touch the have and have nots through a different kind of wealth creation, particularly in the challenged American cities. Companies can help create enough wealth and jobs to distribute them equitably. And if we can make that happen in Newark, and Audible can be a part of it as a successful company, I know that I'll mark this alongside my amazing family, my books, and Audible as an indication that I've done okay. Thanks.